So if you've watched any of my videos on the channel this week, you've heard me say the word palate cleanser once or twice. And that's because I truly believe that's what week six is in college football. You're washing away the stench and negativity surrounding your team from week five. You're mentally preparing your body and soul for the marquee matchups we're going to see in week seven. And on paper, this is not the most enticing week. One top 25 matchup in the SEC. And for some of you, you thought this was a weekend that you could take off. You can go play 18 holes with the boys on Saturday morning. You could take your girlfriend out for a nice afternoon date. You can channel your inner Tom Sawyer and do some chores around the house. <laughs> That's the life. So come here. Shame on you. Shame on you for thinking for one second you can avoid what is going to be a scary Saturday. There will be upsets that will alter the course of the SEC. And I promise you, we got questions to discuss on what happens in week six. So what's going on, SEC Unfiltered? It's Cole Thompson here. Make sure that like you do on Saturdays, plop your happy keister down and hit that subscribe button because we're talking everything about the SEC throughout the college football season. Download the podcast version of the show wherever you get your podcast listening systems. Follow us on the social channels, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, at SEC Unfiltered. If you want the back and forth banter to go on with me, it's at Mr. Cole Thompson on Twitter and Instagram. And check out all of our great work found at secunfiltered.com. This episode is brought to you by our friends over at Roback. Don't you want to look good for the fall foliage pictures? Don't you want to be dressed to the nine on game days this fall? Do so at Roback.com by using the promo code SECU for 20% off all joggers, polos, hoodies, shorts, much, much more. Like the autumn leaves changing, the style of brand is changing at Roback, and you can get 20% off when you just use that promo code SECU. As we do every week, we have questions, but this week, more importantly, is a scary Saturday. And I only think it comes around once in a blue moon because of these are the games that truly will define multiple seasons in the conference. So let's start off with the easy ones, Vanderbilt versus Alabama. Many people are not predicting an upset, but for Vanderbilt, the question, how do you respond after a bye week and can you set the tone against the Crimson Tide? Alabama is coming off of its marquee win against Georgia, the first SEC win for Kalen DeBoer, and now this is the first SEC road test. They already traveled to Camp Randall. I know they jumped around and they said, <laughs> we want to shut them up. Well, can you shut up Alabama in the first half? Diego Pavia, the future quarterback of Thompson Tech Red Wolves, can he find a way to take advantages of creases throughout the secondary? There were multiple times against Georgia where you watched as Alabama allowed marquee explosive play after explosive play across the middle of the field. The slant pattern was just basically a first down on fourth every single time that they attacked. So can Vanderbilt do something along those lines? Third and short move the sticks, set a tone, control the tempo, win the time of possession. Because if that's going to be the case, I don't think that Vanderbilt's going to win this game by any means whatsoever. But what it could show you is that, yes, Vanderbilt still is going to be one of the more tricky teams to prepare for with Clark Lee at the helm calling defense. And of course, Diego Pavia playing quarterback. Let's talk about Alabama. Can you avoid the rat poison? Anybody see what was going on at the Malmore Athletic Complex on Monday morning? <laughs> well, it was just simply Saban wanted to make sure that the message was loud and clear. You can beat a team like Georgia, but you can't fall for the trap of playing against a team like Vanderbilt. Now, naturally, Vanderbilt is a solid overall program, and there is a clear separation between you two. But how do you keep that momentum? Jalen Milrow. How do you make sure that you look like the quarterback that we saw for the first half against Georgia, the one that should be in New York City hosting up a Heisman Trophy Award? Ryan Williams, besides being 17 years old, how do you show that you are the most lethal skill player with a ball in his hands? Justice Hange and Jam Miller, how do you show that the lethal rushing attack that we saw two weeks ago against a team such as Wisconsin, my apologies, three weeks ago, how does that now translate over to Nashville? It is the Music City. So how do you write a sweet tune on the ground for over 200 rushing yards? And if you're Kaitlyn DeBoer, how do you make sure that the roster understands that this is the SEC? On any given Saturday, weird things occur. Don't believe me? The number one scoring offense in the country was held to 17 points against a team that lost to South Carolina at home. I don't know why they can't find a way to beat them. And literally, Mark Stoops' kryptonite is Shane Beamer. But still, anything can happen. 
So how do you avoid the rat poison that you're better than everybody else when clearly you know there is a fine separation? But Vanderbilt's going to give you its best punch. Let's talk about the other game that I don't think is going to be an upset. The oldest South, the South's oldest rivalry, Auburn versus Georgia. Georgia returns home. For Auburn, how do you avoid the turnovers? What's really funny is, and I know that people don't want to agree with this, um, Auburn's actually a good football team. No, really, look up their numbers in almost every single metric from passing yards to rushing yards to run defense to third down conversions. They're a very solid football team. There, there's really only one thing stopping them from being 5-0, and turnovers, literally. If you take away the pick six against Kip Lewis, you take away two interceptions or two turnovers from the Arkansas game, and you take away two turnovers from the Cal game because there were four in each, actually five in the Arkansas game, my apologies, four through the air. You're five and zero, and now you're going into this game where actually people are probably paying a little bit more attention. Last season, remember what happened when the game was at Jordan Hare Stadium, where the Tigers had a roster that was nowhere near the same level as the number one team in the country. Though you couldn't tell me for one second that Georgia was the best roster in America because they didn't play like it. This is a game where if you avoid the turnovers, rivalries have a way of keeping things close. And the personnel is there. Offensively, the personnel is extremely there. Cam Coleman, Keandre Lambert-Smith, who is not the Robin, but rather the night, the night wing because if he has become his own character in the entire Auburn universe. You also have Rivaldo Fairweather. You have good quality play from Perry Thompson, Malcolm Simmons. You like what you have in your one-two combination at running back. Can Jarquez Hunter get a few more carries inside the red zone? And can Peyton Thorne, who is your best option and is coming off of his best game, Avoid throwing into double coverage. Avoid watching a KJ Bolden, a Malachi Starks, or a CJ Allen break up a route and go back for six points the opposite direction. Can you do that? Because if I don't think that we're going to see Auburn walk away with a win, and it's simply because of at this point, you kind of know what Auburn is, but can you beat the 20 and a half point spread? I made it clear that I will eat the most heinous food that you guys can come up with if Auburn scores 20 points. The way to do so is by avoiding the turnovers. And for Georgia, can you be the one to set the tone early? You hear Hugh Freeze talk all the time to pressers, especially on the Monday radio show. We would play them nine times out of ten. We'd win that. We'd won that game. Well, um, Hugh, maybe I would be focusing in on balancing your offense and having more consistency coaching than I would about how many times you would win a fake rhetorical game. Uh, but Georgia would win against Alabama nine times out of ten. Because of the offensive game plan that you saw in the second half, and more importantly, the way that they started playing man coverage defense in the second half, truly was a tone setter for the Bulldogs to nearly pull off the greatest upset or comeback in the history of the SEC. Carson Beck looked sound. You saw the rushing attack be able to find ways and creases into the open field. You watched as multiple wide receivers, Arian Smith, Dylan Bell. You also saw guys like Colby Young step up. There's a lot to like about the direction that Georgia had in the second half. And again, it's Kirby Smart. Most teams would not be able to withstand a 28-0 blundering in the second quarter. But most teams also don't have the greatest coach that currently resides in college football. Georgia does. So can they take that to an advantage? Can they be the ones to kind of set the tone the way that Alabama did last week? Because if I know that this is a rivalry game, and I know that this is not going to be a get-right game, you don't get right in rivalry matchups. Never has happened, never will happen. But can you truly set a tone to be able to get to at least a standard to where it is 21-0, to where potentially it is 17 nothing. where you do feel like that you can kind of take your foot off the gas for a quick second, and not every drive is going to have to be a monumental scoring opportunity for you to be able to pull away late. I think, that, again, rivalry games are weird, but this is not one where I am banking and putting all my eggs that Auburn is going to be able to pull off an upset. Let's talk about Texas A&M versus Missouri. The mobile quarterback for Texas A&M, can you trust it? So I don't know if you guys realize, but Thomas Castellanos is able to run, and Diego Pavia is able to run. And I don't know if you also know this when you talk about Missouri. Um, Missouri hasn't been able to stop the running quarterback. They kept things close. Thomas Castellanos was able to keep drives alive late in the fourth quarter to where even though the Tigers nearly walked away with the 16 and a half point spread, they did allow a late touchdown to keep this thing down to the wire. And Diego Pavia's legs to create a second opportunity also allowed Vanderbilt to take this game into double overtime, both of which were at Faroe Field. Here's the problem. It's not a Faroe. 
It's at Kyle Field. It is at one of the more daunting, dismembering, hostile environments in the SEC, and an 11 a.m. kick in the sweltering heat of Houston, Texas weather, which is right outside of College Station. I know it. I live in it. I've been to those games. Is a nightmare scenario. It is. And so for a defense that has done a great job of containing wide receivers, a great job of containing running backs, but has had its fair share of struggles with mobile quarterbacks, will they fall for the trap? Marcel Reed is a true dual threat quarterback. He offers more value with his legs. Can he be able to keep drives alive on third and short? Can he be able to keep drivers alive on second and six and then go move the sticks for a first down, be able to then target a Cyrus Allen, then be able to target a Moose Muhammad, then be able to target a, a Thor, be able to target a, 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 a Noah Thomas. One of those players, because if that's the case, well, now you're playing the tempo game. And when you're playing the tempo game, you're keeping Mizzou off balance and then forcing their offense to have to attack. This is not one of those games where if you're Missouri, you're down by 14, you're going to be able to catapult to come back. You're not. AM is not a program that you want to mess around with. And even though they haven't had that marquee win just yet, they're favorite at home against a top 10 team in Missouri. And I think that the mobile quarterback has a lot to do with that. So if you are a Tiger fan, and if you are an AM fan more specifically, how do you make sure that the mobility stays moving? How do you make sure that whether it be with Le'Veon Moss setting you up on second and six, whether it be Marcel Reed tucking it run when he sees an open crease, how do you make sure that that does not become the only bread and butter that works, but the one that keeps momentum at an all-time high? And if you're Mizzou, plain and simple, can you let Luther Burden cook with Brady? I know what I said. Can you let Luther Burden cook with Brady? Brady Cook, it's a play on words. Go ahead and look it up. This is one of those games where people are going to, I think, remember who number three is. Because if I think at this point you see other players in the SEC, Isaiah Bond, Ryan Williams, did you know that he was 17 years old? You're hearing about guys such as Tetaro and McMillan. You're hearing about Ricky White out at UNLV. You're hearing about superstars on the come up. And I think that a lot of people are forgetting that the best wide receiver in college football currently resides in Como. These are the type of games that you need him for. These are the type of games of why that relationship was so sound last year and it became the bread and butter of an 11-win season. These are the type of matchups that you salivate over if you are a Tiger fan. Can Luther Burden let Brady Cook? That's all I'm asking for in this one. Can the deep balls be there? Because the personnel is great. I think that you're going to have a solid run game. However, solid for this matchup completely differs than other matchups. Solid for this matchup means that you're going to be able to keep it manageable. This is a great defensive line. This is a great front seven. Scooby Williams looks a lot better. Tori and York looks a lot better. You're seeing Shamar Stewart, Shamar Turner, Nick Scorton, all live up to expectations. You're not going to get a lot of opportunities, but you'll be able to make the most of those opportunities with the combination of, of course, Nate Noel and Marcus Carroll. But can Brady Cook? actually cook one deep shot down the field, especially when you look at that slot formation. The one caveat, the one weakness for Texas A&M is the slot nickel position. Can you get Luther Burden to break free? And then he's soaring, flying like in high school musical. He's Troy Bolton it all the way up into the end zone at Kyle Field. Because if that's the case, there's one of two scenarios I see happening. Missouri walks away with a late touchdown lead and eventually the win or Missouri opens up the can of whoop-ass that we saw last year, and Kirby Moore looks like a genius. He was just saving it for the start of real quality competition of SEC play. Let's talk about Ole Miss versus South Carolina. Folks, another good one. I'm telling you what, this is a game where you do not want to be complacent if you're Ole Miss. And let's just start off with that. Can you establish a number two receiver? Why is the number two receiver so poignant? Because you realize that they have good playmakers. Trey Harris is phenomenal. They also have a quality number. They also have a quality running back in Henry Parrish. Uh, did you guys watch the same game that I did against Kentucky? Because of after the opening drive, where you saw deep shots down the field to Trey Harris, and then Henry Parrish walked on in for an easy touchdown, um, nobody else got targeted. Caden Prescorn had one catch. Caden Lee had two catches. Henry Parrish had three catches. Matt Jones had one catch. Jordan Watkins had one target. Juice Walls had two targets. If you're Jackson Dark, can you spread the football around? Because I can tell you what, this is going to be a front seven that forces Jackson Dart to move outside the pocket. This is going to be a front seven to where you may not have designed runs with number two, but number two is going to be running for his life. 
This is a front seven that can force mistakes in their own backyard in what is the most hospitable atmosphere in college football that isn't ranked among the top 10. Can you have somebody, anybody? Can it be Caden Priestcorn? Can it be Caden Lee? Can it be maybe even one of your transfers that came on in? And I'm not saying like any of the big names. I'm talking like the Utah State kid, Micah Davis. Can he step up? Can you see it from Jordan Watkins? Can Juice Wells actually live up to the branding of, hey, I left this program to win national titles with another program. Well, now we're playing with our backs against the wall. Can I be that guy? Because if once you just rely on number two to attach to number nine for an easy 10, it's not going to pan out. Nine plus two does not equal 10. It equals 11, and that's over the mark. And when you're shooting yourself in the foot by only shooting to one person, you find yourself in a negative situation. South Carolina's defense is one that you don't want to mess with. They can create turnovers, and they can create hell for you in the backfield. So do you have a secondary option? Who is that secondary option? And South Carolina, this is your time to shine. Can you make them live in third down? Can you make Ole Miss live in third down? I know what you're probably saying. Cole, that doesn't seem like a good deal. Why would we want to live in third down? They were one for 10 last week. They were one for 10 last week. Sometimes copying is actually cheating. Other times, it's a form of flattery. You may want to take a page out of Kentucky's playbook on how they handled Ole Miss because they controlled tempo, held the ball for 40 minutes of action. On top of that, they basically blanketed all the other receivers outside of Trey Harris because they knew that that was not going to be a match that they would win often. And also, they were able to put you in third and uncomfortable. The defensive line, for my money, is one of the best in the SEC. It's number two behind Tennessee. That's the way I feel. I do believe you have the best freshman in college football, not named Ryan Williams and Dylan Stewart. I do believe you have one of the most underrated transfers from this offseason in Kyle Kennard. And you do have a great front seven headline by Demo Williams and Nick Eman Ward in the backfield of your, of your leader of your secondary. Jalen Kilgore as well. Regardless, can you make them live in third down? And especially third and long. Because if that becomes the case, it doesn't really matter what version you're going to get from Lenora Sellers and Rocket Sanders. You would like to see those two be at full speed, but as long as you're able to move the sticks, as long as you're able to connect with the Masio Bennett, with the Jacobs, with the Campbell, with a Simon, whoever it may be, as long as you live in that realm and you are forcing Ole Miss to have to play uncomfortable the entire game, it changes. You have to realize that an atmosphere like Willie B on a Saturday afternoon is going to be second to none in college football. You're going to watch as Kyle Field fills the brim for a top 25 matchup, but the loudest atmosphere, the most reputable atmosphere, the one to where people will be talking about it in such a prominent light will be Willie B on Saturday afternoon. By the time we get to the fourth quarter, that game day field will be a major reason why either Ole Miss is keeping things close or Ole Miss is down and out of the count. Can you make them live in third down? And really, more than anything else, third and extremely uncomfortable. Let's talk about one other game before we get to the other marquee matchup. It's Florida versus UCF. Here's the deal. Can the quarterback system still work? You have made it clear, Billy Napier, that this is the week that you're basically going to go all in on what is your season. And I'm not saying that in general because what I really mean by that is this is a week where you're trusting what happened when you were down in Starkville can translate to Gainesville. People last time, the last time people saw you in your own back, at backyard, they were chugging beers as fast as humanly possible during a trick and drive ad. Don't trick and drive ad. Now, we're not preventing that, I'm telling you right now, but they were doing everything possible to make sure that they did not have to see your face. And when they did see your face, they want to boo you. Well, the offensive game plan worked in Starkville. You had two quarterbacks that looked phenomenal. You had two quarterbacks that were able to make concise passes. They were able to build up on their strengths, and they found their way into the end zone consistently. Think four total miss uh, incompletions and, and then also one fumble, but it was in the end zone for a touchdown. Can the two-system quarterback work? And then if it doesn't work, well, what do you do? Billy Napier, let me make this clear. You don't survive this game. You don't survive the season if you don't win this game. You don't. It's impossible. There is no way that the boosters are going to see a brand new Big 12 opponent, a brand new P4 opponent, and more importantly, a school that they don't consider a part of the Holy Trinity down in the southeastern region of Florida to be in their realm of possibility. They don't envision UCF the way that UCF envisions themselves, kind of like we don't envision UCF to be a national champion in 2017. Spoiler alert, they're not. But that's kind of the case. You don't survive 
losing to UCF. And I don't care if the Gus Malzahn special can be alive and well, and I don't care if RJ Harvey and Penny Boone are two of the most underappreciated running backs in the country, and I don't care if you were able to see everything the last few years going up against a guy in KJ Jefferson. I don't. You don't survive if you lose to UCF. So if one quarterback is struggling, if one quarterback is making mental mistake after mental mistake, and even if there are drop balls and you start seeing a little bit of life with the other, you ride the hot hand until it is broken. You kind of have to at this point because the last thing that you can afford to do is see your team come off of a bye and look worse than UCF looked against Colorado. Now let's talk about Arkansas and Tennessee. For Tennessee, case in point, can you have a second punch? That's all I want to see in this game. Can you have the second punch? I know that Nico Iamaliava did not have the most incredible performance against Oklahoma, but he did find his way into the end zone with a 65-yard pass to Dante Thornton. You did watch as he was able to re-corral and use his legs to pick up first downs. And you did watch as he marked into a hostile atmosphere on his first true road environment and got a win by double digits. And the game was never even close to being in reach. For the Oklahoma fans watching this video, I hate to break it to you. It was never close. Stop trying to kid yourself. That 10-point swing was always going to be 10-plus, if not more. But can you have a second punch? The second punch being, can Nico be able to connect with somebody other than Dante Thornton? Can it be Chris Brazel? Can it potentially be a Holden Stays? Can it be a Mike Matthews? Could it be a Squirrel White? Because the first punch actually is not Dante Thornton. Many of you probably thought I was going there. No, the first punch is the ground game. The first punch is you being able to have a cohesive, balanced rushing attack headlined by Dylan Sampson and how he is going to be able to set you up to open up the playbook on second and short or second and long or third and manageable. Whatever it is, you always have consistent progression. But what can be that second element? The passing attack. And you don't need to win with deep shots. You can win with cohesiveness. The explosive plays are going to come. They are. Just watch any single time that Arkansas has lost this year. It's because of not great execution by the composing offense. It's because of one giant deep shot down the field that put them behind the sticks. That's what happened. And that's what does happen. The explosive plays are prevalent out in Fayetteville. So can you have that second punch? Whether it be a short completion to Squirrel White for a first down gain, whether it be a cohesive pass for 15 yards to the outside of Chris Brazel, I don't worry about this defense. The defense is going to make plays. I don't want to hear that the secondary is a problem. They're not anymore. I don't want to hear anything negative about the linebacking core, the front seven, and how you're seeing James Pierce get double team, triple team. That's a good thing. That means your other three defensive linemen are going to be able to create havoc in the backfield against Taylor Green. But your offense has got to have a second push. They're the number one scoring offense in the country, but they rank 33rd in passing. That's all you need to know that there needs to be another level to Nico's game. It's a week off. It's a week to get right. It's a week to prepare. Can you travel once again away from Rocky Top and give a performance that actually shows why we view you as the number one overall quarterback prospect in 2023? And for Arkansas, case in point, can you just not give up the damn explosive plays? Because of every single week, it feels like it's the same story. In every loss, every loss this year, you have outgained your opponent. Look it up. Arkansas finished with nearly 300 more yards of offense against Oklahoma State. But the explosive plays allowed by the defense, the miscommunication on the offense with the turnover rate, whether it was Jaquinda Jackson, whether it was Taylor Green, whether it was a missed field goal, whatever it was, cost you that win in still water. And then last week, the turnovers cost you again. They did. Can you avoid giving up the explosive plays? Because if you play about 75% of clean football, you play about 70% of decent overall quality system, what you imagine the Hogs to be. You have one of the best running backs in the sport in Jaquindon Jackson. You have a roller coaster of emotions, but still a damn good quarterback for my money in Taylor Green that can win the big game that has shown you his ability to create havoc in the backfield with not just his arm, but also his legs. You got an underrated wide receiver at Andrew Armstrong. You got one of the best tight ends in Luke Haas. You got some players on the front seven like Landon Jackson. You're a team that currently feels like it's filled with players, not a roster. That's where I'm at right now. You have good players, not a good core. That's where you got to see. So can you avoid the explosive plays and shooting yourself in the freaking foot? Because if a win against Texas A&M would have you at four and one. A win against o Oklahoma State would have you at 4-1. and one. 
And in both those games, the only person to blame for the miscommunications other than just the sheer will of AM's defense and also the ability to not to, for Mike Gundy not to blow a game at home and boom pig and stadium is you. That's it. That's been the difference of where you reside right now. So if you're Arkansas, this feels like your Super Bowl. This feels like the year where everything kind of has to come together in four quarters, three hours, because of what else can you say? The chemistry is not there right now when it comes to the overall aura of the team. The chemistry on the field is there. It's been there. But can it be sustainable? Can you not give up the damn explosive plays? And can you not shoot yourself in the foot? Please, that's more so the question. Can you just not shoot yourself in the foot? Because if you play 80% of quality football, you're walking away with either a close call against a top five Tennessee team or an upset that we're going to be talking about on Sunday Funday. But if you allow Tennessee to capitalize, just like you allowed Oklahoma State to capitalize, just like you allowed Texas A&M to capitalize, you are now in trouble. And it becomes a culture thing and an internal thing. And for Sam Pittman, this might be the straw that breaks the camel's back. Or in this case, this might be the can that finally is crushed and thrown into the recycling bin. It has to be. He's a good dude. He's a quality person, but you know when I'm leading off conversations like this, the writing is on the wall that things need to be changed. So if you are Sam Pittman, can they be changed by not shooting yourself in the damn foot? Can you not do the old charade of being Arkansas football over the last decade? Because if you see the talent there, you just have to see the vision at the end of the rope. But let me know in the comments section down below, where will you be watching this football game? Because come here. You're watching the football game. You don't have plans this weekend. You're not going anywhere. You have nothing to do. You can tell your mom, your girlfriend, your buddies, who are also terrible for pulling you away from the television screen, I have football. It's a scary Saturday. The man in the Hawaiian shirt and the backwards hat told me I have to be sitting on my couch, and I don't want him appearing on my television screen or worse, knocking on my door, wherever I may reside. Make sure that you're also following us on the social media channels, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, at SEC Unfiltered. You want to keep the back and forth banner going, it's at Mr. Cole Thompson. Check out all of our great work found at secunfiltered.com. And of course, smash that subscribe button because we're talking college football every single day. I'm Cole Thompson. Enjoy the scary Saturday and try to avoid the upset SEC Nation. Peace.